Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the last, uh, certainly not the least, TCAP webinar for this fall, 2013. Uh, today uh, we will hear from Dr. Michael Gore. He is an Associate Professor of Molecular Breeding and Genetics for Nutritional Quality at Cornell University. He received his Bachelor's and Master's degree from Virginia Tech in Black Virginia and his PhD from Cornell University. Dr. Gore um, is an expert in the field of quantitative genetics and genomics and specifically the genetic dissection of metabolic seed traits related to nutritional quality. He's also interested in the field of in the development of application and application of field-based and high throughput phenotyping tools for plant breeding and genetics research. Dr. Gore also teaches two short courses at the Tucson Plant Breeding Institute in Tucson, Arizona. And next year, that would be in January 6 to 10. Um, few of his accomplishments include um, the Early Career Scientist Award in 2012, given to him by the National Association of Plant Breeders, and the Plant Biologist's Early Career Award in this year, given to him by the American Society of Plant Biologists. Today, Dr. Gore will talk about the joint linkage analysis and GWAS for carotenoids and tocochromanols using the maize NAM population, and also a time-related QTL analysis for stress adaptive traits scored in a cotton recombinant inbred population using field-based high-throughput phenotyping platform. So let's all welcome Dr. Michael Gore. Okay. Can everyone hear me fine? Good? Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this webinar today. Um, I always like interacting with graduate students because they always ask the, the hardest questions and really great questions in terms of research. So I, I, I look forward to all your questions at the end of my webinar today. So I've been at Cornell since April of 2013. I graduated here with my PhD in 2009. And I left here and worked for the USDA as a research geneticist in Maricopa, Arizona. And I worked there for three and a half years on cotton. So um, in that time also, I was working on nutritional quality traits in maize grain. And I'm continuing that nutritional quality work here at, at Cornell. And so that's the, the first part of my talk. So I'll just go right into it right now. So where are we going with this? Uh, presentation today. So we're going to be looking at the genetic basis of nutritional quality traits in the maize NAM population. And then we're also going to then uh, talk about the application of field-based high-throughput phenotyping for analyzing drought adaptive traits in an upland cotton recombinant inbred line population. So there's going to be two vignettes here and the first one is going to be on nutritional quality. So biofortification, so that's the area of research that is, is very hard, hot now and has been receiving a lot of interest and funding from uh, Harvest Plus and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. So just to try to give like a general introduction into what is biofortification, that's to identify target genes associated with nutrient crop content in stable crops and the objective here is increasing the nutritional value of local crop varieties such as in sub-Saharan Africa or in India or China by selecting on favorable alleles of these target genes and the um, I guess the real overall um, major cell of biofortification is that has the potential to be sustainable and cost effective so there, there are other alternative uh, approaches that can be used to address uh, nutritional deficiencies in the world. So I'm not advocating that um, biofortification is the panacea that's going to solve all the nutritional woes in the world. But I, I, I kind of see it as a, a very powerful tool that has a lot of potential and, and application to, to human populations at risk in the world. So maize, so this is trying to give like a, a thrust of why maize. So maize is a global staple crop. 
accounts for 15 to 56 percent of the total daily calories in some African and Latin American countries. And in these countries, maize varieties typically do not provide grain with adequate daily levels of essential nutrients. And as probably most of the people uh, that are here in this presentation know, maize has tremendous genetic diversity that can be exploited to develop nutrient-dense grain. So just to highlight some of the, the previous work from um, our nutritional genomics project. So we've, we've done some high-profile research on carotenoids, which is provitamin A. Uh, certain carotenoids, such as beta-carotene, exhibit provitamin A activity. Some of the complications from vitamin, from vitamin A deficiency and include childhood blindness and um, a large proportion of the, the children that lose their eyesight within one year, they, they also pass away. So this, this is like a, a tremendous issue um, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and also in some countries in um, South America as well. So this, this is one, one of the, the main um, traits that we've, we've been analyzing in maize because we feel that can have one of the largest impacts in terms of humanity. So two critical genes that were identified from the pathway, this is like E, and that was Jorge's et al. 2008, and then uh, a hydroxylase enzyme called CRIT-RB1, and that was Jan et al. 2010. So marker assisted selection for weak uh, like E and CRIT-RB1 alleles has enabled the efficient development of high vitamin A maize, and this has been a joint collaboration between CIMIT and Harvest Plus. And this is, I think, one of the few examples where marker assisted selection has actually worked and we've been able to translate some of these like early findings in, into an actual product and um, this this is, is like a very great proof of concept to, to show that the uh, approaches that we're using are, are working well in terms of breeding. So that, that was our, just a very brief overview of our work with provitamin A and we're also working on tocochrominols, which some of you may know as vitamin E. So tocochrominols are lipid-soluble antioxidants. They consist of tocopherols and tocotrienols, and alpha tocopherol has the greatest vitamin E activity. So vitamin E is an, an essential nutrient. Suboptimal dietary intake exists in certain population segments of the world. Um, in the U.S., vitamin A uh, deficiency is actually an issue for some of the older generation of our, our population. So deficiency is associated with cardiovascular disease and decreased immune function. So the major take home is um, for, for this, in comparison to say vitamin A deficiency, vitamin E does not even come close. But it is a, a present problem and it's something we, we have been addressing through our, our quantitative research. So when we look at um, the alpha tocopherol levels in grain from a maize diversity panel, they, they tend to be low. So just to give an overview of what this maize diversity panel is, so this is 252 diverse maize lines that were evaluated in West Lafayette, Indiana at Purdue University. And, and these lines capture a tremendous amount of the genetic variation and variation for the phenotypes as well in, in the maize public germplasm pool. So this is kind of like a global collection of, of maize here. And on the x-axis here we have alpha tocopherol uh, ranges and then on the y-axis we, we have the frequency for the lines for a, a particular grouping. So the average is 8.19 and so if we have a biofortification target of 38 on and this is on a dry weight and if um, an individual you know human being is eating 400 grams of say maize uh, per day then that is in uh, about a five-fold increase is is needed on on average in like a maize germplasm breeding pool to meet the um, estimated daily requirements of alpha tocopherol intake for an adult. 
So the population that we're, we're now using is the nested association mapping population, which is called the, the Maze NAM panel. And this is a collection of 25 diverse maize lines. Uh, it, it's about equally tropical versus temperate. And all of these diverse lines across to B73 as a common reference parent. And from, from each of the F1 plants, there have been single seed descent carried down to the F5 family. And there is approximately 200 recombinant inbred lines for family for a total of 5,000 recombinant inbred lines. So this is a, a massive um, quantitative resource that the maize community has at its disposal. And this population has been grown out and phenotyped, uh, I, I believe, since 2006. And all, all of the genotypic information for this um, population is, is public, and seed can be requested from the maize genetics stock center as well. So this uh, NAM population has been used for analyzing traits such as flowering time, leaf architecture, tassel inflorescence, um, stalk strength, flowering time, and day length being like photo period, kernel composition being like oil and carbohydrate and other disease resistance traits such as leaf blight. For our, our work, we analyzed tocochromanol composition in NAM grain and the, the maize NAM population, so all 5,000 recombinant inbred lines, and, um, it's, and also check varieties were also grown because it was grown as an incomplete augmented block design because to grow actual two reps of the maize NAM population would be over 10,000 plots. And that's just not really feasible um, on such a large scale for, for most academic labs. So when, when we're looking at tocochromazole composition here in this pie chart, this is the average across all 5,000 recombinant inbred lines from the 25 families. Uh, to cofferols, which is T here, um, and that's in red, those are mainly found in the embryo. So we have three species, alpha, gamma, and delta, okay, um, over on our right, and alpha on top, and then gamma on the bottom. So what I would like to point out here is like 50% on, on average of the tocopromanols in maize grain, half of those are gamma tocopherol, but gamma tocopherol only has about eight to 19% of vitamin E activity compared to alpha tocopherol. And you see up on top here in red and in a circle, alpha tocopherol only accounts for 11.2% of, of the total composition of tocopromanols in maize grain. And alpha tocopherol is important because it has 100% vitamin E activity. And there's tocotrienols as well, which is mainly found in the maize endosperm tissue and those are in blue on the left. As, as you can see here, the alpha through gamma, their proportions are largely similar to um, tocopherols, but really um, gamma tocopherol is, is a major species found in, in maize grain and that's mainly, mainly found in the embryo. So there's nearly a five-fold difference between gamma and alpha tocopherol content in, in maize grain. So as a breeding approach, what you want to do is, in, in a sense, kind of re reverse that composition in the maize grain where you, you want higher alpha tocopherol because that has 100% of vitamin E activity. And so it's kind of a trade-off. So if, if you're going to increase alpha tocopherol, then you're going to have less gamma tocopherol then. So how do we analyze this maize NAM population? So first, we jointly map QTL across the 25 families. And that's um, the first bullet point here. So it's called JL. And so this uses a stepwise model selection procedure using 14,000 SNPs dis distributed throughout the genome. And then what we do then is we um, 
they're then using the ancient recombination in the maize NAM population to find like the actual genes, or we, we hope to drill down to, to the genes through, through GWAS, because on average, L, LD and the maize genome decays to about 2 kb within genetic regions of the maize genome. So how, how this works is we're incorporating the joint linkage analysis results. So we're, we're taking the re residuals from one chromosome while fixing QTL on, on the other nine chromosomes. So maize has 10 chromosomes. And then we're using a model selection procedure and then we're projecting uh, 28 million SNPs from, from the parents on, onto the NAM recombinant inbred lines. And we're able to do this projection because we have whole genome sequence information from each of the NAM parents. And then we're able to do the projection of those haplotypes onto the recombinant inbred lines because we're able to have um, defined the recent recombination breakpoints in, in the NAM population through uh, genotyping by sequencing. And that's where those 14,000 SNPs come into play. So when we first look here, so these are the joint linkage results um, for, for the six tocochrominol compounds. And so for these six compounds, we, we found a total of 100 QTL. So I would like to draw your attention to the y-axis here, and that's the number of, of QTL. And in, in red here are the tocopherol species, and in blue are the tocotrienol species. And for alpha tocopherol here on the far left, we identified 13 QTL. And for gamma tocopherol, we identified 21 QTL. So as you think about this, though, this is a biochemical pathway. And these traits are actually fairly heritable. So the heritability range of these six traits ranges from 0.71 to 0.88. And um, a trait such as flowering time may have 30 to 40 or even more QTL. So these, these traits are, are not very polygenic. And in, in terms of like QTL con controlling a pathway, there, there may be only, say, 13 key QTL for breeding for alpha to cofferol. So this, this trait is not very complex as such of uh, some of the other traits that have been analyzed in the maize nam population, uh, as I was saying, such as flowering time or even like plant height. So being able to analyze traits in the maize nam population, we can then determine what are the number of QTL and the effect size of these QTL that differentiate each of these diverse lines from the common parent B73. So when we're looking at this uh, graph here, up on top in the, the blue are positive effect QTLs. So this is like the, the sum of the additive QTL effects that are positive. And down below are the additive QTL effects that are decreasing the amount of alpha to cough for all in the seed relative to the common parent B73. Okay, so if we look over on the far right, we, we see for parent NC350, this particular uh, maize NAM parent, there are three positive effect QTLs and then one, of, one QTL that decreases the amount of alpha to cough for all. Now, in, in contrast, if you look at parent uh, CML247, which is over to the left, and that has an, an oval around it. We see that there's three positive effect QTL as well, but the summation of the allelic effects for those QTL is smaller than the summation of the QTL effects for NC350, okay? So that's, that's just to show that even though each of these lines have three positive effect QTLs relative to B73, not all of the effect sizes are, are equal. And this um, line in particular has, has four QTL that decrease the amount of alpha to cough for all, 
uh, relative to B73. So one other uh, critical point to draw from this is each of these diverse maze lines that have been crossed to B73 is, in a sense, a mosaic of QTLs that, in general, increase or decrease the amount of alpha tocopherol. But also, there, there are some um, of the diverse lines, such as like CML52 or OH7B, that do not have any positive effect QTLs. So then you can think about making crosses to then pyramid like all of the positive effect QTLs for the particular alleles that are superior in contrast to B73. So our, our next question that we asked is, of the QTL that we identified, of the QTL support intervals, how many overlap with the known biochemical candidate genes from the MEP pathway, GGT, phytol synthesis recycling, the aromatic amino acid pathway, and then the, the core structural enzymes for the tocochromanol pathway here. We see that we've, we've hit, in a sense, all of the, the core tocochromanol pathway, so all of the VTE1, VTE3, VTE4, and VTE2, all of these core genes that are important for making tocopherols and tocotrienols are underlying QTL peaks. And then there are also other candidate genes from the parental group and aromatic head group as, as well. But about two-thirds of the QTL hits, though, do not co-localize with one of these known candidate genes. And that's, that's one, one really big finding here because um, this you know, pathway is very well characterized in Arabidopsis and rice. And it seems like there's still a lot we don't know about what is the genetic control of, of this pathway in maize grain. So now we have these QTL support intervals, which could be rather large. And now we want to use the ancient recombination in, um, coming from like the evolutionary history of maize to do GWAS. So we, we hoped, in a sense, to be able to find map our QTLs now. So you can kind of think of the maize NAM population as a map within a map. The, the first map is you know, using like the 14,000 GBS SNPs to tag all of the recent recombination. And then the, the ancient map, which is, in a sense, based on LD, um, the amount of LD decay in the maize genome is um, considering 28 million SNPs. So here we're now doing GWAS with 28 million SNPs. So when you look at the um, y-axis on the right here, this is the minus log p-value of the joint linkage QTL peak, OK? So our, our top hit is in this little green bar that has an oval around it, OK? And that's on chromosome 5. And then our GWAS marker um, threshold here ranges from 0 to 1. And this is uh, what is referred to as RMIP. And this is, in a sense, the number or the percentage or the proportion um, that a particular SNP is in included in a model. And, and that model is run 100 times. So our, our peak GWAS SNP here is incorporated in, into the, the model a perfect 100 times. So its GWAS score, if you will, is 1.01. .01. And that particular peak SNP falls with, um, within ZMBTE4. So over here on the left, I, I show the pathway. And ZMBTE4 is critical for the conversion of alpha tocopherol. I'm sorry, it's a critical for the conversion of gamma tocopherol to alpha tocopherol. So, so here we, we have like a major effect QTL that explains like 80% of the phenotypic variation in the maize NAM population. And then we were able to use uh, GWAS with 28 million SNPs to get down to, to the actual gene that's con controlling a large proportion of the alpha 
to call for all variation in maize grain here. So this, this candidate gene, if you will, makes, makes total sense. And we, we have also confirmed the same re result in that maize diversity panel of 252 lines that, that I showed earlier. And that was recently published this year in G3. So now we wanted to ask the question is, what is the genetic basis of this QTL? So is differential expression of this gene among the maize founder lines, is, is that what's driving this variation for, for the QTL? So in the sense, the question that we're asking is, is this an eQTL? And we have a great genetic system to ask this question because we have 25 diverse lines that have been crossed to be 73. So we can then correlate the QTL effect estimates for each of the founder lines at this particular QTL and on chromosome 5 and correlate that with the FPKM values from genes within the support interval for this region. And I'll explain further on, on the next slide here how we actually carry this out. So for each of the, the 25 maize NAM founder lines, they were grown out in a field and grain was uh, kernels harvested on these indicated days after pollination. So it was harvested 12, 16, 20, 24, 30, and 36 days after pollination. And then we're, we're also comparing this expression level to RNA isolated from root and shoot of seedlings that were grown in a growth chamber. So what we have here are the, the rankings, and this is just a simple Pearson's correlation here. We, we have the rankings of the top 10 expressed genes within this QTL support interval. So our most strongly correlated gene is actually the ZMVTE4 transcript, okay? So what this is telling us then is if there's such a strong correlation between the transcript level for ZMVTE4 with the actual allele QTL effect estimates, then what this is saying then for a positive effect QTL alleles, they're correlating with higher ZMV4 expression levels. So this is indeed in an eQTL. And then we even like carried this further, even though it was just testing with, with 25 lines, we then use the FPKM values as our phenotype. And then we ask the question, where is the cost of polymorphism within this QTL support interval that's controlling this variation for the differential ex expression of ZMVTE4? And in a sense, what is the controller for this QTL? And um, our top SNP actually turned out to be a, a SNP in the promoter region of uh, ZMVTE4. So we can now kind of con conclude that, okay, this is an, an eQTL at ZMVTE4 that is, you know, con controlling the variation for alpha tocopherol content in maize grain. And it's very likely it's cis controlled because um, the, the actual top peak SNP was um, 1.5 KB from the um, translational site where it actually starts. So, so the actual peak SNP fell right in the promoter region. So we also wanted to test this for other traits such as uh, gamma tocotrienol. And here we, we have our, our top hit for uh, joint linkage QTL mapping uh, is on chromosome 9. And this is also a very large major effect QTL and it explains about 51% of the phenotypic variation. And our top GWAS SNP here um, goes into the model almost 100% of the time. And it's um, 61 kb downstream of an enzyme, HGGT1. And this is also known as VET2 in the Arabidopsis community. So if you look to see where this enzyme is in the pathway, this, um, this core enzyme is um, important because it's interacting with HGA and GGDP. 
So then we, we also wanted to ask the question, is this also in, in EQTL? So we did the same thing. We took the FPKM values and then we did the correlation with the effect estimates for the QTL on chromosome 9. And once again here, I'm just showing the, the top 10 um, ex expressed genes ranked by their correlation with the QTL effect estimates. And this support interval was, was actually larger. So there were maybe close to 200 genes in the support interval region. And the ZM HGGT1 transcript came out on, on top here. And we can see that it's very strongly expressed in, in maize grain from 12 to 36 days after pollination. And then there is a weak expression of this particular um, gene in seedling root and shoot tissue. So there's, there's kind of a trend here for um, genes in the pathway, at least, that they, they seem to be EQTLs. So some, some of the conclusions that we can draw from this first vignette is um, we found 13 to 21 QTLs for six compounds, suggesting that tocochromanols are not high, highly polygenic traits, such as flowering time or plant height. There's an emerging trend that expression differences appear to be the genetic basis of most of the identified QTL. But also, I would like to caution, there's still much to learn about the genetic control of the tocochromanol pathway in, in maize grains, because two-thirds of the QTL did not co-localize with like a known uh, pathway gene. So it, it's very likely those could be tran transcription factors or other controllers that are re related to expression of the particular gene in the seed. So some of the future directions that, that we want to do with this uh, work is investigate pleiotropy, QTL by environment interaction, and two-way epist epistasis in the context of a biochemical pathway. We're also beginning to use co-expression analysis to help identify causative genes underlying the QTL peaks. So it's, it's very easy when you, you have your, your peak snip right in like a, a very strong candidate gene and you're able to then um, in a way validate it with the um, RNA-seq work. But when you don't have very good candidates and then maybe you have weak correlations between uh, genes with an QTL support interval and um, the QTL effect estimates, you, you need to come up with other approaches. So what we're doing is uh, using co-expression -ex analysis here to try to come up with these different modules to see which genes are co-expressed. And I think that that'll help shed some light on, on what is going on in, into some of the QTL regions where we don't have clear known genes. Um, we're also planning to undertake biochemical studies to characterize causal genes and variants. This is obviously a very long-term goal and, and project. When you think about cloning out different alleles or, or haplotypes and ex expressing them in E. coli vectors and trying to understand how different SNPs or indel variants can contribute to like the functional variation. And we're also beginning to do allele mining, I'm sorry, allele mining for development of nutrient-dense maize. And this, this population, at the same time, we also did uh, carotenoids on it. And we're also doing various B vitamins as well. And we also um, have been collaborating with um, folks to look at iron and, and zinc in, in this population. So really, um, Kind of the approach that we're taking is, you know, like a multi-trait genomic selection strategy where you're not just breeding for one new nutritional trait, you're breeding for like maybe three or four even more nutritional traits at the same time. So now shifting gears, I'm going to begin talking about some of the field-based high throughput phenotyping work in, in cotton. And a lot of this work um, was carried out when I was employed by USDA ARS in Maricopa, Arizona, which is about a half an hour or 45 minutes uh, south of Phoenix, 
just, just to kind of give you um, an idea of the geography. So what kind of propelled me to begin working in field-based high throughput phenotyping is um, kind of soon thereafter when I was hired, there was a, a tremendous like drought in Texas as we probably all remember. And, um, and and I also kind of think, depending which part of the region of the U.S. or even the the world that you're in, uh, almost every year you you hear people quoting or, or saying this is one of the worst droughts in in years. So when I think about you know trying to draw upon my my passion as a scientist and you know thinking of needs for for research, um, this this picture kind of hits home because it's, it's like this is a farmer who's trying to produce a crop to bring in income from his, for his household and, and his family. So when, when, when we think of um, research in terms of climate change, we, we need to think of um, very powerful approaches to rapidly re respond to climate change in terms of plant breeding populations. And when I think about that, I, I very much think in the context of genomic selection where you can think of recombination being the engine of plant breeding. And you want to turn the, the crank of that engine faster and faster. So genomic selection affords us the possibility to produce crops faster. And in the case of cotton, we would want to produce Cotton, new cotton varieties that are more tolerant to environmental stresses such as heat and drought stress. But there's certain areas of genomic selection that, that still need improvement, such as training the models, accelerating recombination, trying to manage the level of diversity in the population, finding informative lines. And then the, the purple that I've added to this slide is improving phenotyping capacity. And that's, that's kind of where I, I feel like my, my contributions can lie. And this is a high throughput phenotyping platform that I developed with colleagues when I was in Arizona. And when we look at, at the sensors, the platform, and the, the vehicle, and look at, at the various tools, we have infrared thermometers to measure canopy temperature. We have ultrasonic transducers to measure plant height and we have multispectral crop canopy sensors to measure vegetation in indices, such as like um, PRI or any other indice that you can maybe think of or haven't even thought of that, that may be valuable in the future. So here we have like GPS RTK antenna, uh, Campbell Scientific data loggers, and GPS RTK receiver and radio. And so when this particular tractor is then driving through the field, it's able to measure plant height, canopy temperature, and vegetation, or I should say um, the reflectance of the crop canopy all at once. And this tractor is able to do four rows at a time. And when all of the phenotypes are collected, um, because everything is on GPS, we're able to link all of those phenotypes to GPS readings. And the, the actual field map it itself is, um, in a sense, in, in GPS coordinates. So everything overlaps very nicely. And this uh, platform has been recently described in functional plant biology, and it's in press right now. And that can be accessed at the journal website. So kind of like the, the first proof concept was looking at canopy temperature and in a recombinant inbred line population, close to 100 recombinant inbred lines. And this is Gossypium hirsutum upland cotton. And this is TM1 by NM24016. And there's two treatments. Uh, one treatment is, is wet. You can call 100% ET replacement. And there's two reps for that water treatment. And then one treatment is 50% ET replacement, and you can call that dry or drought, OK? And all, all of these cotton um, inbred lines were grown on drip irrigation. And growing it on drip irrigation gave us the opportunity to precisely control the water uh, 
when we turn the, the water on and how much the irrigation goes for and how severe of a stress we, we want to impose on the crop. So when, in, in a sense, when you look at this heat map here, and this is a heat map of the actual cotton plots, and this, this is um, uh, an output from, from ArcGIS, and what this is showing here is the, the canopy temperature of, of the plots. So it goes from dry rep one to wet rep one, dry rep two to wet rep two, and, and the bluer it is, the cooler it is. So those, those are the wet plots. So there's enough soil moisture to allow evaporative cooling of the canopy. And um, the, the dry plots, kind of like the greener it is there, the, the hotter the, the plots are. But then you, you can also see an area of the field where in dry rep one, where it's kind of blue. And what's happening in there is there's a higher clay content in the soil. So what we did is looked at the electrical conductivity of the soil of the field with an EM38. And then we were able to get an idea of what is the um, percentage of, of clay in the field. And it just so happens in, in that area there, in, in that dry rep one, there's, there's a higher clay content. So it's critical if you're doing drought testing, you really need to understand the like soil variation in your field. And then you can use re regression models and, and, and blocking factors and AR1, AR1 covariance variance um, in your like proc mix model to try to con control for those field e effects because if you don't control for those field effects, you can lead to an e erroneous finding that that could be just in, in this case, you're breeding for like soil content and you're not breeding for actual true drought tolerance. So this is like a proof of concept here. And this is looking at, OK, is there a time by treatment interaction for, for canopy temperature? And the, the blue line is the is. Uh, for the wet plots and the red line is for the dry plots and then the black line is ambient air and as you see from like 7 a.m approaching 1 p.m the canopy temperature of, of the dry plots is in increasing faster than the canopy temperature for the wet plots and and that rate of increase is fastest from 10 a.m to 1 p.m so as i was um saying earlier is, is that when there's not enough soil moisture, then the plants are in a sense shutting down and they're not gonna transpire at a high rate. And if they're not gonna transpire because they're trying to conserve water, then they're gonna shut down their transpiration rate and then their canopy temperature in turn will increase. So that's, that's what's happening there. So when we looked at the phenotypic variation, uh, one of the first questions that I wanted to ask is, is canopy temperature actually heritable in this recombinant inbred line population? And when we looked at the broad sense heritability for uh, wet versus dry, we can see for wet it has a heritability of 0.52, and for the dry plots it has a broad sense heritability of, of 0.58. So this, this is actually heritable, so that gave me good confidence to then check to see how repeatable it was from week to week. And um, I'm sorry, it looks like this it's blocked out here. But on the x-axis here is day 217. And on the y-axis here is 224, so it's one week later. So what we see here is, is there is a fair amount of repeatability for doing phenotyping at canopy temperature at 1, 1 p.m. And this is the, the ratio of dry to wet canopy temperature for, for the um, plots. And it had an R square of 0.472. So what we can kind of draw from that is there's a consistent phenotypic re response to heat and drought stress in this population. and. Um, Having worked closely with uh, Jesse Poland at Kansas State University, 
we did genotyping by sequencing on this cotton recombinant inbred Lyme population. So that gave us the ability then to do QTL mapping. So this is, in a sense, time-related QTL mapping. So day 217, that's 7 a.m. and at 1 p.m. and then the following week, day 224 is 7 a.m., 10 a.m. and at 1 p.m. So if it is blue, that means the particular QTL effect coming from the parent uh, TM1 is actually decreasing the canopy temperature, whereas the, the red colored is an e effect coming from the parent TM1 that's actually increasing the canopy temperature on a particular day. Um, if there's a black rectangle border around a particular QTL effect estimate, that, that means it, it passed the 0.01, I'm sorry, 0.05 permutation threshold. So as you see, for, for the ones that passed the threshold, the, the QTL had the strongest expression at, at 1 p.m. And, and importantly, this QTL seemed to, to have been re repeatable. And that would be the one, say, on, on chromosome 10 to the far left, and then the one on chromosome 20 to the far right. And so using um, an index called Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI, we were able to calculate a index that can then kind of quantify the degree to which a particular cotton plant genotype wilts. And that's calculated by NDVI PM, subtract, I'm sorry, that's for the wet, subtract NDVI PM for the dry over NDVI PM for the wet. And this, this is just an example here of a particular um, cotton plant. And as you see, it's very droopy. It's under severe drought stress and leaves are beginning to wilt. So what's, what's happening here, though, since the NDVI is measuring the amount of greenness, as the plants wilt, more soil is exposed through the canopy, so then the amount of greenness as like the tractor is driving over top of the crop canopy, there's, there's going to be less greenness. So that's precisely what's happening here for the dry plots. If you look at 7 to, to 10 a.m., you can see a slight decrease in the NDVI value, but then it really drops fast from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And so what's happening there is the plants are beginning to wilt a lot more. And you can see for, for the wet plots that the actual um, NDVI value is increasing ever so slightly from like say 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And what we think there is um, that the the actual plants are, are tracking the sun, so they're they're changing like the orientation of the leaves. So in this in the sense, it's changing the geometry of the canopy as as the plants track the sun. So then we wanted to see what is the repeatability of the wilting index from week to week. And this also had a very strong R, R square. In fact, it was even stronger than the R square of like 0.4 for canopy temperature. And this had an R square of 0.76. So it's highly re repeatable and it had a very good heritability. And then we wanted to also do a QTL mapping of this wilting index trait. Um, the, the first QTL I would like to point out is on, on the far right, and this is um, chromosome 25. And this particular QTL seems to be highly ex expressed, um, decreasing the uh, amount that the plant wilts. So what I kind of take from, from this is this QTL is expressed at almost all times. So if we compare it to like the QTL on uh, chromosome 13 and chromosome 17, those QTLs seem to be expressed only on 224 at, at 1 p.m. And the QTL on the far left, the C10-38-8, that particular QTL was also detected for canopy temperature as, as well. 
So there, there may be some pleiotropy there. So some of the next steps for hydrophenotyping in cotton, um, we're beginning to evaluate the relationship of canopy temperature and the degree to which a plant wilts with fiber yield and, and quality. So we, we think it's you know, key to relate all these phenotypes now to like yield and, and fiber quality. We're also beginning to integrate seed ionomic and HP, HTP uh, field-based uh, information. So kind of the key there is there's certain compounds such as maybe potassium or calcium in the soil that maybe can be used to sense how, how tolerant a particular plant is to, depending how much water it's taking up from the soil. And then um, we're, we're using the seed ionomic profile to maybe re relate that to to drought tolerance. We'll um, also be getting to think about HTP for very large cotton populations. So Cotton Incorporated is funding a project to create a cotton NAM population. And we're also interested in, in doing GYE of the cotton NAM population and doing uh, beginning to look at genomic selection and breeding programs. And we're also starting to test non-contact uh, um, equipment such as the LIDAR, which I'll, I'll show some of our early output from that. So here we have on the, the right is, um, uh, so what this is, is, is cloud points. And so it's reconstructing these cloud points to recreate the um, canopy geometry. So on the far right here, we have plant height. And then on the, the left here, we have like canopy width. And then we can then begin to integrate some of these cloud points on um, a higher resolution plane. And then we, we can then begin to recreate like the actual shape of a plant and the shape of the canopy in the field. So we're, we're thinking about, you know, being able to QTL map, you know, canopy geometry traits. But we, we also want to think about how does like the, the size and the shape of the canopy geometry re, relate to drought tolerance. And so that's, that's over on, on, on top of the canopy, but obviously um, we're not able to look at the roots with um, this um, optical technology. So one, one thing we're beginning to investigate now with, and this is with Sean Thompson at Texas A&M who is going to be joining as a postdoc in my lab here um, in May 2014. He'll, he'll be funded by Cotton Incorporated. And that's using a ground penetrating radar to measure root biomass and root structure as well. And he's, he's made some great inroads in the use of this technology to do root phenotyping in, in wheat. And I, I certainly encourage you to go look at his website and look at some of his um, PowerPoint presentations that he has on some of his work. And so I think in terms of like the future of, of plant phenotyping in terms of the field, I'm beginning to think um, hexacopters or what some people re refer to as S UAS or drones. So um, being able to mount like cameras on these hexacopters and being able to program in uh, GPS coordinates and then take photos of your, your field um, at various time points throughout the growing season seems to be a, a very powerful uh, approach. And um, assuming it's not too cloudy and the wind isn't blowing very hard, um, it, it seems like an um, valuable approach to, to be trying in upstate New York. Um, and here we have on the, the right an image that was taken with a hexacopter of Jesse Poland's field at Kansas State University. And this is using a color IR camera. And these photos are from Kevin Price, a collaborator at Kansas State University. So when we think about then looking at G by E, and using the NDVI as an uh, informative index for 
for a particular breeding population or some GWAS population or a GS population. So what we can do is then begin deriving uh, various uh, coefficients throughout the growing season and then we can then use these NEVI values and then make a plot over the, the whole growing season for each genotype to try to figure out how many growing degree days does it need to reach flowering, what's the rate of dry down for a particular genotype, when is it finally um, you know, time to harvest. So there's, there's, there's like a lot of, I think, critical factors that we're just beginning now to think about and to really begin to understand what is like the phenology of, of a particular population and then being able to use these high throughput phenotyping tools, being able to then do routine and repeated highly accurate phenotyping over the course of the growing season really allows us to begin to ask these, these questions, you know, what are some of the critical genes that are turned on at various time points in, in the growth phase of a plant? And then we can begin to combine these with a particular crop model to then see how a particular genotype will perform in future climates. Okay, with, with all of that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators at MSU, Dean Della Pena, Robin Buell, Purdue University, Robert Rocheford, and some of the great collaborators at Cornell University, such as Ed. And these are PIs and co-PIs on an NSF grant that's funding the nutritional quality. And some of this work uh, has been funded by the USDA. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my, my former team and, and lab at um, the USDA in Maricopa that helped a lot with the high throughput phenotyping. And especially Pedro Andrade Sanchez, who helped with uh, the creation of the high throughput phenotyping vehicle to do the high throughput phenotyping of cotton, and Jesse Poland, who helped out with the genotyping by sequencing of the cotton population to allow us to begin doing the time related QTL mapping. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gore, for that very, um, very interesting uh, talk today. So, who wants to g give the first question? Anyone? From the participants, you can just type in in the chat box, and I can read it to Dr. Gore, or he could read it himself also. Okay, um, I have. I have a question, or probably just a clarification. Um, you mentioned in the cotton thing, the the NDVI. You said that the NDVI change in the a decrease in the wet, a dry plots was more of like due to the more wilting and then more soil that's been exposed, and probably was the one taken by the the sensor. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that. That is correct. Um, one, one thing that I would also like to add is I, I think it's also picking up certain changes in, in the canopy geometry that are not related to the soil as well. So I, I think there's, you know, part of it is, you know, contamination from the soil, if you will, that it's like decreasing the amount of greenness that's being seen in the canopy. But I think it's also picking up maybe some very fine changes in, in the canopy geometry as as the plant wilts. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, that was just um, interesting to me because I was I'm working also with crop scan and yeah, that would be <laughs> good information. Good. Good. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I think we have a couple of people writing. So there's a question from Zerachin. Are these two forms of tocochromanols highly correlated or not? Uh, that is a really good question. So in general, there's 
tends to be a low correlation. So, um, and, and we've also kind of shown this in our G3 paper. So, it's, it's, so what we're, we're kind of drawing from this, since it's a low genotypic and phenotypic correlation, then that the, there is a low amount of like pleiotropy in a sense like sharing of QTLB between these compounds. So there, there are some core QTL that are shared but there is more sharing, in a sense, more or higher pleiotropy of, like, say, for tocopherols versus tocotrienol. Okay, I could. Okay, another question from Jun Lee. Did you use water index, and what is the difference between water index and wilting index? So I did not if, use yeah. a water index. Um, it is definitely something I want to investigate. Um, so there's different versions or flavors of the water index. So it kind of depends whose publication that you pull it from. So um, my particular index that I, I'm using, I pulled from a, a Brassica publication that was maybe published, oh gosh, maybe three or four years ago. So if you're using a particular water index, you would want to come compare it to mine first, but I, I can't say which one be, because there's like a few variations of what some people refer to as a water index. Okay. Um, other question, do we apply imputation in both GWAS and LD analysis? Uh, that's a great question. So we do imputation for GWAS, but in, in general, we do not use imputation for LD. Because um, part of that reason, it, oh yeah, okay, why? So part of the reason why is if you're imputing and then running an LD, then it actually may give incorrect re results because what tends to happen is is um, when we're doing the imputation, we're sometimes just carrying like sometimes large blocks of LD over. So what what happens then is when you look at your LD plots, you you may have these artificial um, like large blocks of LD but it's just driven from the um, errors or uh, I should say lack of resolution from imputation. Okay. So, so no overburdens in LD? Um, so no overburdens in LD. I'm not sure what that means. Um, working loads if not imputed I uh, is still typing probably Oh, sorry, I meant about, about MAFs. Oh, so generally when, when we're testing for LD, we use the MAF cutoff of uh, 5%. Um, so there, there are, okay, so imputation in, in maze is generally really, really challenging. And for quite a few years, we haven't been able to do imputation very well because LD breaks down so fast. But in Ed's lab here at Cornell, they have a new imputation approach that um, I think is going to be fairly highly accurate and, and work for, for major and other software. LD breaks down very fast. But in, in general, um, when I'm you know, calculating LD, 
I, I tend to not use imputed SNPs, and I, I use an MAF cutoff of 5%, and that, that 5% is also uh, used as a cutoff generally for, for GWAS, say, in, in a population of like 200 or 300 pounds. So because generally there's, there isn't enough power to detect like a rare QTN in a population of when you only have like uh, 200 to 300 lines. So that's, that's kind of why like the maize NAM population was created where you have a really constructed by a parental population. And in theory, if there's no segregation dis distortion, then all, all the alleles should be at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, so I think one of the fundamental, well, I, I actually should maybe couch that as in, I think it's a very Im important question to, for us, you know, in, in the 21st century to, to try to find out what is the contribution of rare alleles to quantitative traits. But generally, if you're going to do it with like a population as would be used for GWAS, you would end up being in like what the people who analyze complex traits in like humans where they have populations of like 10,000 to like 20,000 people or even more. Um, so kind of like the, the approach that we've been taking. So when we have the ex extreme outlier phenotypes, we've been making by parental crosses with those to, to see if, if they're actually rare QTL controlling that extreme variation. So there, I think there, there are ways to get at um, some of the rare QTLs in the world, but generally it, it creates more work in a sense you need to have very large uh, GWAS populations or you need to create like uh, biparental populations. So. Okay, cool. Um, so I think we'll end the webinar. This time it's about time, about an hour. So um, thank you everyone for staying and um, attending this afternoon. And again, thank you, Dr. Gore, for um, spending your time and giving us your sharing us your research and resources today with us, the students. Well, um, if if anyone has any follow up questions, they they can either call me or send me an email. And I thank you for the opportunity to to share my research. And I wish everyone a Happy holiday season and a great new year. Great, that's great. And um, this um, webinar will also be posted, recorded, and be posted um, in the Plant Breeding Training Network for those students who are not able to join today. And also, probably a copy of a PDF of the of the slides would be 